Well, I have a, again a special guest this morning. Preston's been on the channel before. Preston Sprinkle is a scholar and an author and a speaker um, about a number of issues. And in my last video, which I'll link below, we covered you know some of Preston's story and uh, what he's been doing and how he's come to this. And today we're I've been on my channel doing a series on same-sex marriage and the Bible. And Luke um, on our channel said, oh, you really have to talk to Preston. And Luke's kind of been a go-between between Preston and I. <laughs> and, and Preston was kind enough to send me his book, People to be Loved. And Preston also has a wealth of material online. And Preston, you've this has been one of the issues that you have spent a lot of time with. How did that begin? Yeah, it's a great question. I get that all the time. Uh, thanks for having me back on your show, Paul. I'm a, a huge fan. Um, I listen to podcasts at night typically, and um, you might like to know I've literally spent all night with your voice in my <laughs> ear because sometimes I fall asleep and I wake up, fall asleep, and it just goes from episode to episode. So this is uh, a lot of fun. It was several years ago back in, I want to say, maybe around 2012, 2013, when out of a scholarly interest in the conversation, uh, I just got interested in um, understanding what the Bible actually says about homosexuality. And even that phrase actually is, can be instigating and, you know, uh, we can get into that. But my, my MO as a non-denominational uh, evangelical Christian growing up, uh, we are very passionate about what, what we believe, and sometimes we don't really know why we believe it. And so that's been, for the 25 years I've been a Christian, that's been a huge MO of mine of, of I want to know why I believe what I believe. I have all these assumptions I grew up with, but if I can't, um, under, if I can't defend, not defend might be a little too strong. If I can't articulate them from the text of scripture, then maybe I need to reevaluate re that. And I've done that with several uh, issues and have changed my view on some hot button things like uh, the use of violence, um, uh, under our understanding of hell, and um, e even things like immigration and, you know, these kind of politically charged issues. When I go yeah. back to the Bible, I'm like, wow, this narrative that I grew up with didn't quite represent what the Bible actually says. So I, I came at the question of same-sex sexuality with that in mind. And so I went through a really rigorous study of scripture. And I know uh, you talk about this a lot. Um, there is no view from nowhere. Uh, we all have biases. But I do think those biases exist on a spectrum. I think some people are more aware of their biases than others. I think some people have other societal pressures that color their lenses more than others. Um, and so I did my best um, to acknowledge my biases and treat the text as fairly as I possibly can, knowing that that's impossible to do 100%. And we can talk about my theology, you know, where that took me theologically. My, but conclusion is it took me back to affirming a traditional view of marriage. But now I feel like I understand the issues uh, much better. And I've wrestled with the counter, the pushbacks and everything. But in that journey, something happened. I, I, got a, <laughs> I actually got to know gay and lesbian and transgender people and just listened to their stories and heard their spiritual journeys. And that, uh, that I mean to say it wrecked my heart and reoriented my perspective would be um, an understatement. The most common phrase I heard from gay people uh, was number one, I was raised in a church. 83% of LGBT people raised in a church. That's just a stat. Um, and yet, you know, they, they will say oftentimes, I've never met a Christian that was kind to me once they found out about my sexuality. Um, I've never met a Christian that just wanted to hear my story. Uh, and I can go on and on and on. And I'm sure you can too. Your audience who is who, who, who knows LGBT people or who are LGBT themselves have their own slew of stories of um, a, a difficulty, <laughs> to say the least, that they had while um, existing in the evangelical church. And so I've had this perspective that um, some people find contradictory. Um, some people don't know what to do with, but I think a lot of people are silently resonating with that we can maintain, um, passionately maintain what the Bible says about sexuality and marriage. Uh, the Bible clearly gives a very 
strict countercultural uh, i would i would say creational sexual ethic that is going to be um not popular it never has been that popular ever really um <laughs> also aspirational is, yeah yeah it's <laughs> for, gonna for all of us <laughs> exactly yeah exactly uh, um and, and so we can maintain that passionately and not be ashamed of that and yet we can also radically love people who fall short of that sexual ethic to the point to where like Jesus, we might be accused of going too far with this whole uh, grace thing. And so I get hit. Um, sometimes I'll get back to back emails from, from the right and the left <laughs> that sound almost identical in tone and rhetoric and inability to give a charitable understanding of what somebody's saying yet have very different uh, concerns. Um, so I, I think, uh, but I think that's a good place to be. I think a lot of evangelicals, a lot of a growing number of evangelicals are searching for a more nuanced, hyper gracious, hyper truth oriented view of these issues. So that's a long answer to your No, it's not question. a long answer. Well, we have a, we, I, I deal in long answers, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not afraid of do. them. And yes. I, I really, you know, part of, part of what, you know, when I approach this issue, Again, there's no human beings cannot that we we cannot see the world from nowhere, as you said. We we do not in many ways answer these questions in the abstract. Finally, we we sort of like the view from nowhere. We sort of pretend to in moments, but even if you're a church leader at a senate or a conference or a church board or council meeting, you have to deal with questions like these in the particular, in the actual, and not in the abstract. And, and part of the, the Christian life is dealing with people, and I, part of why I really love how this book um, is shaped is you know right there in the red letters on the front people to be loved and that if there's a hierarchy of of positions that we ought to have with people <clears throat> that is at the top of the christian hierarchy that right. first and foremost people are to be loved and so before we say anything about what anyone is doing what anyone has done what perhaps people deserve, how people should be treated in the particular and actual, that's the first rule. And, and that's, that's not hard to come to if you look at Jesus. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, I mean he, Jesus had this profound ability of articulating an extremely high standard of obedience. I mean, like, look at the Sermon on the Mount. It's like one of the most stringent speeches in all of religious history. And yeah, even the way the narrative of Matthew is set up where you have, um, uh, you have speech, narrative, speech, narrative, speech, narrative. The ensuing narrative is related to the speech. So you have Jesus giving this speech that articulates this high ethical standard in Matthew 5 to 7. And then in Matthew 8 and 9, what does he do? He goes out and loves on all the people violating that standard <laughs> that's right that's right that's right <laughs> and that tension like somehow luke 15 1 is astounding that it says sinners and tax collectors were seeking out jesus to hear from him even though he is rebuking greed and thievery and adultery and sin and all this stuff and yet for some reason his, his character is so compelling that he was drawing the very people who were committing the sins that he was denouncing and I, I just a sweet tension that we should be striving for. And we just haven't as a church in this conversation, it's become so polarized where either you're, you know, love is love is love defining love in very secular terms, or, you know, I'm going to hold to the truth. And, you know, if, if I can love somebody, that's, that's okay. But as long as I maintain the truth or however you want to frame it. And I think we've missed Jesus in how we've gone about this conversation. Generally speaking, I think there are a good number of people who are actually doing it well. Now, now you've spent a fair amount of time working with various individual, because individual churches, Christian denominations, because at least in the Protestant world, 
Um, that's sort of the landscape. There are congregational churches and independent churches and non-denominational churches out there, and they in many ways sort of have to chart their own path because they're non-denominational, but yeah. then there are also denominations. I'm a minister in the Christian Reformed Church, which is a denomination. The denomination itself has policies, and obviously if I want to continue as a minister in good standing in the denomination. I have to subscribe or adhere to those policies, so on and so forth. What has been your experience in working with Protestant churches on this topic? Messy. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting. Uh, energizing, discouraging. Uh, yeah, we've worked with, we've worked with this uh, CRC, more with the R RCA. Yeah. Um, your, uh, the RCA has been tearing, is I mean, the RCA may, it might have unraveled this summer, but there won't be a synod, but the RCA has yeah. been unraveling over this issue for decades. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, and, and I, you know, I've gotten to know several just really amazing people in these denominations. Uh, the, uh, Free Methodist Church, we worked with the um, um, Assembly of God, the, the Foursquare Church, a lot, a lot of really diverse denominations. I, I, you know, in one minute I'm in this, you know, stuffy kind of, you know, reformed environment. Not that all of them are, you know, then I'm in this wild charismatic environment, but it's, it's so neat to see the, the common passions and desires. And I just, I just want to give a shout out to all of my evangelical leaders that I've been working with. I mean, massive, massive hearts for people. Uh, oh, the evangelical covenant church is, is, is just killing it when it comes to how they handle a lot of these issues, killing it in good ways. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I have, I have met just so innumerable, innumerable, is that the, um, more, more than I can count, evangelical leaders from many de different denominations who are truly seeking to follow Jesus's grace, truth, tension when it comes to these, these issues. Um, my, so here's, I, I think with some, deno I won't name certain denominations, but I do have certain ones in mind. I do think they, um, it's become so polarized that they can't even have, they don't know how to even have a humanizing conversation um, about these things. So you have, and I, I, I will, I'm going to show my bias here. I, I do see it more from the progressives within those denominations than I do from the so-called traditionalists. That's just my anecdotal experience. Okay. One of the beauties of postmodernism is you can't disagree with my anecdotal experience. You can't, you can get mad or whatever and say, no, you're wrong. That's just, I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's statistically true. I'm just saying in my experience for the last several years, working with multi denominations, many of whom have a majority who are maintaining a traditional view and then a, 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 a loud minority who are pushing back against that. It does seem that the rhetoric from the progressives is built on slurs. Um, you know, you're a bunch of homophobes, you are on the wrong side of history. Um, you, you know, don't you know that you eat shrimp and therefore Leviticus and you know, all these lazy, lazy, really accusations and slurs. And it kind of plays into even stuff going on in our society today where there's this um, moral outrage that is at least shaped by what I would consider an, 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 an unhelpful uh, brand of identity politics, um, neo-Marxism, there are evil people and good people instead of, what's that? Who, who came up with that line? The, you know, the, the line between good and evil runs Solzhenitsyn. on the heart of every human. Who is that? Yeah. Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think a lot of that plays into this. So if you're on the wrong side of history and if you affirm traditional view of marriage, then this binary, then you are now in the homophobe, Trump voting, white supremacist camp, and you're, you're an evil person. And then we're the one, okay, so I, people won't quite say that, but the outrageous posture toward that um, can, can certainly feel that way. And I would say conservatives have traditionally maybe brought some of that on themselves by our, yes, I think there has been homophobia and disregard for LGBT people and just really unhelpful ways in which conservatives have gone about this conversation. And so the, there, I, I can understand and almost see some justified reaction to that. But anyway, so we have these two, and then, and then okay, so I want to fall. Okay, so on the conservative end, some people think, 
you know, every single person who affirms same-sex marriage hates Jesus, the Bible, and all this stuff. And it's like, well, I know a lot of friends who are affirming who wrestled with the text for years. Well, if you don't care about the Bible, you don't wrestle with it for years, you know? So yeah, yeah. I, I would significantly disagree and, and with some of their interpretations. And I, I would question um, maybe whether they are truly, you know, uh, believing in biblical authority by the way they maybe handle some passages. But I'm not going to just say, oh, you can care less about the Bible. You know, some of the affirming books I have on my shelf have more text from scripture than some of my conservative books, you know? Um, so yeah, so that, that, that polarization, binary, good and evil, you're right. I'm, you know, you're wrong. I'm right. You're evil. I'm good. That doesn't make for a good recipe for actual dialogue. I think we saw that in the UMC conference where you had almost borderline racist comments from white progressives in yeah. America. It was, yeah. I was yeah. like, whoa, are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the yeah. black leaders are like, look, we've been colonized before by you white people. We don't need to be colonized by your secular sexual ethic again here in 2019. I'm like, oh my word, what is happening? You know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's been, I think we need to learn how to have a dialogue so that we can truly seek to understand before we seek to refute. You can't truly refute until you actually understand what it is that you're refuting. You can't understand until you give a charitable understanding of the other position. Um, yeah. Well, uh, and I, I, I got into this space for exactly the reason you articulated in that I saw the Christian Reformed Church wrestling with this. And the Christian Reformed Church has been in some ways talking about this since the 70s. There was a, there was a significant report that our denomination did in 1973. Uh, there have been subsequent reports since then. But in the, in the middle of the, night, of the 20 teens, when this was rising again on the Christian Reformed Church synodical dockets, I had seen with other issues a significant inability of the denomination to carry forward a conversation that could be loving and productive and respectful. And, you know, it's, I've, you know, obviously now with, um, with what's going on in the country, we had a, we had a curfew last mm -hmm. night in Sacramento, you know, on the race, on the subject of race, mm -hmm. People keep saying, you know, can we have a conversation? And I often get that sort of from the progressive side. And so often I hear that and I think, I would love to have a conversation. Can mm -hmm. we agree on what a conversation is? Which is yeah. two people coming to a space with differences of on lots of layers and spectrums mm -hmm having a conversation where we can actually, and I think John Verveke and his work have, have, have really helped me find some language for this, where we can, we might not leave the conversation agreeing with each other on a particular or on a policy or on something like that, but we can both leave the conversation with a better understanding of our differences and perhaps even leave the conversation with more respect and even love for one another, and perhaps even more ways that we can love one another, even with our differences. Yeah. One, yeah. one of the things that um, one of the things that I have noted is that whatever someone wants to think about the progressive activism on this topic, the traditionalist side has changed, I think, in their capacity for repentance, hmm. understanding of the ways that the church has failed to love people with various situations and various... Um, inclinations let's say and whatever you know whatever as and in my opinion actually 
I expect the church will have this conversation, not just for decades, but potentially for centuries. Because if you go back in church history, churches have conversations for that long. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I think, if, I think even if individuals are traditional on this topic in many ways, they have a debt of gratitude to owe to the progressives mm -hmm. in terms of helping traditional Christians or historical Christians recognize how we have not loved. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I don't know what you think about that. No, I, I've often said, I, you know, um, as much as there would be theological different disagreements between, well, between myself and my um, affirming friends we share a strong commonality of um i would say holy outrage towards how um people who identify as lgbtq have again never met a christian who was kind to them <laughs> that's just and here's it's so bizarre because paul says in romans 2 4 it's the kindness of god that leads to repentance so you cannot it's an absolute bold-faced double standard to say they need to repent right whatever that even means who's they what's repentant what, what do you, um and then not embody the radical kindness of god so i mean ask your gay friend neighbor coworker. hey when you think of the christian church like real like a really biblical evangelical church what comes to mind until they say oh church oh kindness until they say that we're not embodying the presence of god as we ought um, if Romans 2, 4 means anything, which it, hopefully it, sh it should. So, um, so when, you know, that survey was taken 15 years ago by Gabe Lyons and David Kinnaman in the book, um, Unchristian, and when they surveyed non-Christians and, and said, what's your impression of the church? Number one response, 91% said anti-homosexual. That's just, that's, that's, that's just not, that's not biblical. And, and I'm tired of conservatives hiding behind the phrase, the lazy phrase, biblical, to justify all their previously held beliefs without having the courage to actually re-examine those beliefs or take them back to, to Scripture. So it's so all that to say, yes, when, when I, my, there are, is, like with any issue, I can find some resonance with somebody that I disagree with on 90% of issues. Hopefully there's 10% we can agree on, like all humans are created in God's image or something. So with my progressive friends, this holy outrage, um, toward the marginalization, shame, isolation um, of LGBT people in the church, um, the, the, the dehumanizing rhetoric. The, you talk to any gay person raised in a church and the, the piles of shame that has existed in their hearts and has been magnified by the rhetoric of the church, it's, it's heart-wrenching. You know, when they talk about when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, and wrestling with my wrestling, not like yeah, I'm yeah, loud and yeah. proud gay sleeping yeah, with everybody, yeah. you know, no, no, they're wrestling. They're like, God, take yeah. this away. I want to, what does this mean? And they're wrestling with their sexuality and the rhetoric of the church is oftentimes unintentionally compounding internalized shame so that they think they are absolutely intrinsically disgusting before the God of the Bible. I know people, I know Christians, closeted gay pastors in evangelical churches, I get, I get a lot of emails, Paul. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. I, I do oh. a little tiny series as part of ours, and it's every time I do one, it's like, oh, I don't want yeah. to do this. Oh, man, if somebody saw my inbox. Um, but, I, yeah, closeted, theologically, politically conservative gay pastors, Trump voting, very conservative gay closeted pastors in their um, 60s and 70s, who say there's not a day that goes by when I don't have to go out of my way to convince myself that God doesn't hate me and thinks I'm disgusting. We're talking about people who have never acted on their attraction, but just, yeah. Yeah. They're, just the fact that they experience this, we'll say temptation, right? Yes. Um, it just magnifies piles of shame. I mean, can you imagine? I don't know what that feels like to go through every day with, with shame screaming at me from morning till night. And that shame is being magnified by the rhetoric of the church. So, yeah. so yeah, my, my progressive friends get all that. They get all that. And they're like, Preston, just come to our side. And I'm like, well, it's not about sides, first of all. And, yes. and I, you yes. know, yes. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and, and <laughs> I love that you said that because it isn't about sides. No. <laughs> and I understand. And, and to me, so much of this 
gets into, as some people have called it, the problem of wineskins. That and and part of what motivates me to want to keep talking about this in my denomination, a lot of the messages I get from uh, people that I colleagues that I dearly love and respect is the time on both sides, frankly, the time for talking is done. The time for bright lines is here. The time for picking sides is now. And I think, okay, but this is one issue. And the difficulty we face is that not just on this one issue, but on whole numbers of other issues that I could bring up very quickly and people would say, oh yeah. The church has a real problem of dealing with this thing that Jesus embodied that we really struggle with, which you, I think, articulated very well a few minutes ago with respect to the Sermon on the Mount, that um, Tim Keller sort of raised Jonathan Edwards on this, Jesus' diverse excellencies. Mm. How can, on one hand, the church be... Um, embody such an amazingly high ethical standard and at the same time embody such radical love and acceptance via community of people who not only are not meeting that standard now, but also have questions as to whether or not that standard is correct. Right. Because, you know, one of the facts that I keep reminding people about Jesus is that um, people will debate whether or not Jesus did miracles, but a few people will debate whether or not he lived. But mm -hmm. the one fact about Jesus' life that almost no one will debate is that he was killed. Mm. And it wasn't an accidental death. It's that people on opposite sides of a culture war, at least as fierce as our own, both came to the conclusion that this world would be better with him silenced and out of the picture to the degree that they could, they couldn't collaborate on anything else with respect to how Judea or the Galilee should be run, but they could agree that they wanted him dead. Wow. <laughs> That's, that, that, wow, that yeah. is one piece, historical piece of the story of Jesus that no one disagrees. And mm -hmm. so what you have to come to is the, uh, is the question, why could Jesus generate that much anger hmm. and be the guy that people, churches flying rainbow flags will look at and say, he's a model of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And other churches say he's the model of holiness. This is the historical record yeah. on this man. Whatever, it means, son of God, yeah. miracles, put all that stuff aside. This is the truth about Jesus. And in some ways, if the church does not embody, and, and see, very quickly you begin to see that, to one side, we want our churches to be so overwhelmingly loving and affirming and tolerant that no one could have a problem with it. Well, that doesn't really measure up to Jesus. Yeah. On the other side, we want exactly what you said. We want a church that is so radically, so radically embodies love that the discarded misfits of this society who everyone else could agree, I mean, did Roman soldiers who were, um, who were likely the ones who were the Johns for these Jewish girl prostitutes, mm -hmm. did they respect, you know, the prostitutes they were sleeping with? Usually not. Um, yes. You know, and it goes on <laughs> from there. And to me, issues like this one, in how they bring the church to to these moments are exactly the kinds of issues 
that could potentially be doorways into other levels of witness and power that I, I think, quite frankly, we shy away from because we don't like what they'll cost us. Yeah, yeah. Man, we could close in prayer there, man. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, J Jesus was a disruptive historical figure, but he 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 didn't have a side. That, and it's just what you said, like he disrupted the Roman agenda, right? He disrupted the Pharisaical way of living. He he disrupted sinners. Uh, sometimes by accepting them, you know, by, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, he, um, was he tolerant, tolerant? What? I, I don't know. There, there's so many modern day categories, I think that are so infused with modern day, not just politics, but partisanship. And I, I don't know that. I think that I just wonder how tethered these two sides are in this conversation to secular, partisanship I'm, I'm i'm somewhat mennonite in my view of politics you know I, and you're, I'm and an you're getting more so in some ways yeah as i've I been mean, watching your trajectory yeah 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 i mean i often say i'm an exile living in babylon and in november babylon's going to re-elect another babylonian leader and i'm going to be sitting on the sidelines kind of like somewhat entertained but somewhat like wow you babylonians i don't know like <laughs> You're just going to reelect another Babylonian leader and it's going to instill Babylonian values. And I'm going to keep living in exile, trying to model a different way of being in the, in the world. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, but then uh, theologically I'd, I'd lean more reformed. So I say, my, I you know, I'm a reformed Mennonite and people say, what church do you go to? And I say, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have a home. There's like three of us in the world. Um, so I, I'm so I'm curious. You asked me the question about the denominations. I I would love to hear from you. This I mean, you're neat. You're steeped in the CRC, not just as a member, but I mean, you you know a lot of higher ups. You really you you have an ear to the inside. Um, what, how is it going? Where's it going to end up? Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the whole thing? I so I I, I actually gave a little speech on the video I posted today when I was, um, Nick, who has been on my channel, I, I sometimes call him for cult Nick because he, uh, when he first, when he first contacted me and wanted to do a conversation and we had a conversation, he let off the conversation. I've been a member of four cults and I told my <laughs> wife this and she said, and now he's listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> but Number he five. This, that's right. <laughs> he, he asked me this question. He said, um, because the, the people of my local meetup started a Discord server, and now we've got about a thousand people who are signed up on this and members of this Discord server. Yeah. And, and the, the dis, I've always wanted, and, and again, I didn't, I probably, I probably scotched any hope if I, if I had any left of, of becoming in a denominational employee by making videos about Jordan Peterson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and then you know starting a meetup and one of the things that after the meetup started to gather most of most of the people who gathered for the local meetup are atheists or um some layer of something and we were having we were having free and open conversation with each other about things we cared about and the Discord server has managed to embody that too. And, and Nick then in that question and answer asked me, he says, why do you think, you know, some of what people have been attracted to you on your channel, why do you think <clears throat> some of that has been manifest in the Discord server? And, and I told the story of a split in the Christian Reformed Church in the 1920s and 30s between over the issue of common grace. And so theologically in the Reformed tradition, the, some of the proto, I'd say they were, I'd say Abram Kuyper and, and, and Herman Bovink wrestled with the issues that Karl Barth wrestled with sort of a generation before. And Abram Kuyper 
who was this Dutch polymath who became not only a theologian and a founder of a newspaper and Christian labor unions and, and uh, <clears throat> a university and eventually became prime minister of the Netherlands, had this tension within him of, and you will know this from your, of the antithesis, which something like, you know, the MacArthur School will emphasize there's black and white, there's sides to choose. Yeah. But also common grace, which is God's love and spirit works in the world and, and blesses people on the opposite side of the line. Hmm. And yeah. so it sets up this dynamic where there's both a line and not a line. And of course, you know, if you think about that long enough, you say, well, of course, because in your life, you need lines, you can't live without them, but there are, are things that cross the line. And so you always need both of those things. And so there was this big fight over the issue of common grace. And there was in Western Michigan, a one of the most vital Christian reform pastors in the days before mega church, he preached the Granville Avenue church way above a thousand people. Hmm. And, you know, and he was a dynamic pastor. Um, in that period of time in World War I, the denomination was putting up flags because Deutsch and Dutch were close enough that Americans in the heat of World War I didn't trust, didn't trust the Dutch. And the Dutch were like, we're not German, we're Dutch. <laughs> I know we're speaking this language. And so Christian Reformed churches started speaking English and started wrapping their churches in flags. And Herman Hoeksema said, you know, we're not going to put any flag in our, they can burn it down. You know, this is the kind of people these were. They can burn it down. We're not putting a flag up here because, you know, this is not about country or Babylon. Well, this guy started a church split over this issue of common grace. He said that Abram Kuyper stuff about common grace, it's a load of crap. It's the antithesis. And so you can imagine what kind of church, what kind of churches gravitated towards that. Black and white, light and dark, us and them. And my Herman grew old. He had a son, Homer, married my father's my father's aunt marie and she was known in the family as saint marie because she was known for her humility her godliness her generosity all of those things well eventually it came time that the family was taking care of old old herman and the family was wrestling with the care and were thinking about putting him in a home and the family was talking about that. And rumor got out into the congregation that the family was talking about putting the great man in a home instead of taking care of him themselves. And all fingers pointed to Marie. And Marie hadn't, you know, she hadn't gossiped. She hadn't, it was an unfounded accusation. But she basically was shunned by the church where she wasn't able to have access to her grandchildren mm. years later. And this caused um, my grandmother married my grandfather and they were members of the Christian Reformed Church. And this was all happening in the Protestant Reformed Church. And these are tiny communities of Dutch immigrants in Western Michigan, you know, and, yeah. and throughout the CRC network. But the but the the shaming, mm -hmm. the stigma, all of this created something in created a generosity in at least my grandfather and grandmother that got passed down to the degree that, you know, church ought not to be about this. And and when my grandfather um, did not want to take a call to Canada, went to Owen Sound, Ontario. My aunt suffered from this because the educational system was bad. My father didn't even go because he was ready to go to college. My grandmother hated Canada. Um, 
the the Dutchmen were coming after the Second World War to Canada. There were Frisians and Hollanders. They weren't getting along. Thinking back of it now, everyone was just had, you know, post-traumatic stress from <laughs> enduring the occupied Netherlands. They were in this church. People were horrible to each other. My grandfather, who was actually a Jew, but that they covered up because I don't know even that story, but was fluent in both Dutch and Frisian. And the Frisians in the church didn't know he was fluent in Frisian and would talk about him behind his back in Frisian. And he understood everything. I mean, and, and so... But in all of this, and then my grandfather had a tough time getting a call back to the United States because, number one, people thought he, was, he didn't speak English well, even though he grew up in English. And number two, they thought he was Canadian and he was kind of a boring preacher. I mean, so, <laughs> and then my father, after seminary, goes and spends most of his career helping black folks who have migrated up to the New York metropolitan area try and find a life, you know, escaping Jim Crow, but finding Northern racism. Mm -hmm. So in my family, there have been generations of understanding about what it means to be on the bad side of the church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think my grandfather probably got this partly because of his Jewish background. And I don't know what happened with my great-grandfather and my great-great-grandfather that they went to Western Michigan and changed all their names and suddenly became Dutch Reformed. Um, <laughs> and then he marries my grandmother, who has this family story of, of St. Marie and her shunning. And then all the bad stuff that happened in Owen Sound, Ontario, and my grandfather learning to love. I mean, my grandfather, my grandmother had these stories of how horribly, sometimes very well, but how horribly they were treated by different churches during the, during the Depression and after the Second World War. And then my father was not treated horribly in, in Patterson by the black folks who were just struggling, but poured out his life to, to care for these people. And, and what, it, what it built into me now generations later, when suddenly we have this meetup is, okay, we've got, <laughs> we've got all these atheists who don't believe in God and are really suspect towards Christians. We've got, you know, non-Trinitarians coming in our mix, triggering the, the Christians who are Trinitarians. Now, recently on the Discord, we've got kind of a mouthy guy who used to be a Hasidic Jew who, who really is, likes Jesus but says the Apostle Paul was full of crap. And <laughs> I love this. Yeah. And I want the church to be a place where we can talk about this stuff and we can love each other, whether they're prostitutes and sinners or Judaizing Pharisees, <laughs> because that's just another way of prostituting yeah. and sinning. Yeah. And for my, for my Calvinist roots, I find a theology that maps onto this, because we're a tribe that said, we believe in the antithesis. We're we T, big T tulip, total depravity, that's me. So am I a bigot? Am I a sexist? Am I a homophobe? Am I self-righteous? I mean, everything on both of those lists I have in me. And if Jesus can save me, who has everything from both of those sides, well, how about people who are majoring in one side or the other? Yeah, yeah. You sound like Francis Chan, man. <laughs> the, <laughs> the white, slightly older. Uh... <laughs> but, you know, you know, it's fascinating the, how, who Jesus chose to be part of the 12. I mean, you have like, he deliberately selected Matthew the tax collector and then Simon the zealot. <laughs> Simon the zealot is 
violently trying to overthrow Rome. Matthew is selling out to Rome. I mean, this is, you cannot get to more polar opposites. And Jesus intentionally, it wasn't like, oh, they happened to kind of come to them. I don't know. We don't know about the conversion of Simon the Zealot, but we know that he came to Matthew and said, come follow. He saw, I need you, you tax collecting scum. (laughs) I'm collecting scum and we're going to turn the world upside down through a band of renegades who don't know how to even look at each other, but we're going to learn how to do that in community. I mean, it's, um, no, I, I love that vision. I am a little bit pessimistic about whether it can happen. I'm hopeful um, and yet pessimistic. And I think I do, I, I, just, I would love your, I mean, I, I do come back to how polarizing our societal conversation is and how the church is intentionally or even subconsciously just kind of walking in line with these black and white, not racially, but you know, these two different uh, tribal identities. And, and I, and maybe it's because in my experience with the sexuality conversation, this almost identical rhetoric I see in politics, or again, more specifically partisan mudslinging, I see adopted by those who are on the say, I don't, you know, far left and far right. Cause I think a lot of people in the middle are, are maybe more nuanced, but um, have you found in the CRC that kind of um, how um, American partisan politics is not helping how people approach the sexuality conversation? Yes. Can you, okay. <laughs> it's so gotten uh, yeah, worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, no. So I, so on my channel, I've had a friend, Rod Hugan, who, is in Tucson, Arizona. And I think he in many ways has done well with this, but I mean, it's again, we're, we've got the problem of wineskins and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I I was thinking, you know, if I were ever to leave the CRC, I, you know, I might even try to go to a, a church with, um, you know, a church with really low standards, like, you know, the, and we can name some mainline churches, but what's been interesting is that you would think, so you have churches out there that are saying, we're not going to police anyone's sexuality. Oh, okay. I, that, and, and, you know, yeah. churches that are like about radical non-policing, but what has happened on that side, and this has been interesting to watch, is that side has gotten tyrannical in their own ways too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, whereas, I mean, there was, I think 15 or 20 years ago, there was sort of the sense of, you still had a hegemonic power in the culture that Christendom and the church had had in which people who are, advocating for misfits and outcasts had a degree of um had a degree of i don't know how to say it they they were they were they were speak they were they were speaking truth to power Mm. and now now in some ways the tables have shifted i can i think depending a lot on zip code and you probably know that better traveling around more than i do but in some ways things have sort of shifted as you know the political landscape has shifted and now it's sort of the traditionalists in many places that are the ones speaking truth to power and and that's often a better look Mm -hmm. for Mm. the church but i i still i i still am not giving up hope that I don't know if it can be scaled up to a denomination, but I think we need denominations. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have all of these issues in me that I can't resolve. And another part of me that says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell short on them by resolving them too mm-hmm. quickly. And that's, and that's what I really enjoyed about your book. Mm-hmm. That, you know, and that's a really hard thing to do in a book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so where, well, I, I want to ask you the question, because again, sure. you've traveled around more and I think you have a sense because, mm-hmm. because when I, when I hear some of your story, uh, so you, you know, educated sort of 
cut your theological teeth in, you know, the MacArthur Reformed Dispensational Tribe. I don't, I, as a Christian Reformed pastor, I look at them and say, are, are you really Reformed? I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and to be clear, I no longer belong. That tribe doesn't acknowledge yeah, my But But existence. you've been around. Yeah. And that, so then, you know, with Francis Chan, with, um, you know, you've been around. And so I guess I want to ask you, have you seen, tell me about some of the places, some of the, some of the mm -hmm. wineskins, because I think, I don't think these issues are going to be resolved exegetically. Yeah. No. No. I think they have to be resolved, and I think this is deeply Christian, they have to be resolved in community, people embodying these tensions as individuals and in communities as church. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's something that is deeply, theological, right, deeply theologically right, because part of what happened in modernity is that we try to imagine people as sacks of propositional affirmations, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we, we're not going to get away from propositional affirmations. Right. But it's only in real life, human beings, and in community that we actually begin to embody what the gospel is pointing yeah. at. Yeah. So yeah. in your travels, yeah. tell me about have there been some glimpses that you've gotten in some places? Yeah, I've got so many thoughts swirling. I'll, I'll just start maybe talking and see if they keep talking. Start aligning. I mean, don't be afraid to talk for a long time. I certainly have done it. Okay. <laughs> I, I love that about your channel, by the way. I love, you know, yeah, you'll go on these tangents for a while. And I'm like, where is he going? I enjoy the tangent. I'm like, what is this related? Then like an hour later, I'll, I'll never forget Jordan Peterson in one of his biblical lectures on, on the flood. Two and a half hour lecture, I think it was. And two, two hours and 10 minutes into it, he's going on and on and on. About, okay, I forgot what it even was. And then he, right before the end of his speech, he goes, and that's all background for the flood. <laughs> Like he didn't even get, just was this all week i got a complaint from a member of my church about precisely this in my sermons <laughs> and it's like yeah she's right she's yeah. right she's right i could do uh, that on my channel but i really people say why you is your church it, so yeah. small it's because of me <laughs> but anyway please <laughs> i disrupt go on oh man okay so um Let, let me begin with a statement. This might be my conclusion, and then I'll maybe walk backwards and fill in some of that. I, until the, and I don't like any, there's no label that's perfect. I don't like non-affirming. I don't like traditional. I really don't like conservative. It's too politically charged. So I'll, I'll just go with traditional for the sake. Until the traditional church, those who hold to a historically Christian view of marriage is the, my preferred phrase, until they can embody radical kindness and i would maybe need to fill in what that even means toward lgbtq people until they can concretely and like in action love um people uh, uh, much better than they have our theological credibility will not um be compelling for the next generation we have a whole generation of younger millennials and gen z who don't want to be a part of a church that they can't bring their gay friends to. Um, so until he, so for the sake of maintaining theological, for the sake of theological pre preservation, we need to do a much better job in concretely loving LGBT people. What does that look like? I mean, I can give you tons of examples. Um, one conservative church, I think they were in San Francisco or maybe it was Chicago. It was a, it was a progressive neighborhood you know, conservative church and they offered free child, it's a very expensive neighborhood. And they were offering free childcare, knowing that half their neighborhood were lesbians with kids, knowing full well that most of the people taking advantage of that would be lesbians bringing their kids. Well, these lesbians, you know, were so blown away. They said, it costs us $60,000 a year in childcare. You're offering it for free. We're just, we're, we're they, they came with like, deer in the headlights like i don't we don't understand this like why and then you know of course they start showing up at the churches and now they're like oh what do we do you know all these lesbians are coming you know but like th that's a that's a concrete way of saying 
we do hold to a traditional sexual ethic. Um, we have reasons for that. We are Christians. Um, uh, we don't expect people to understand that. You know, I don't understand why Jewish people don't eat shrimp. Or, well, I guess I do, but you know, I, I don't, but I, that's, that's part of your religion and we're Christians and here we do have a very countercultural sexual ethic and, and no, we're not going to force that on others. But if you do want to do the insane thing and say, I want to make a crucified Jew, uh, my Lord and savior, I think he rose from the dead. Like if you actually want to believe that and say that person that you've never met, you never heard from, well, if you're charismatic, maybe you have, but you know, I'm going to live my life very counterculturally. It's going to bring a lot of pain and suffering. And if you actually want to make that claim that, yeah, that's going to come with a very specific set of, um, you know, uh, rule rules, uh, guidelines on what it means to live that way. Um, where is that going? Oh yeah. So, um, but, but that, that's, you know, taking active steps to say we do hold to this sexual ethic. We are Christians, but we do radically love all people that fall short of that. And what that looks like, you know, there's a messiness there that we're, we're trying to figure out. Um, other churches, you know, there's a big, huge conservative Baptist church in, in, in Orlando that was on the front lines of reaching out to the people that were suffering in the Pulse nightclub. And a, a lot of gay people got, well, I know a few that got saved through that. They were so blown away at the kindness from this homophobic bigoted church that was reaching out with love and, and by love, meaning like they were like paying bills, they were comforting families. They were, it was actively loving people who were suffering from this massacre. Um, uh, there's churches in conservative theologically, theologically traditional churches in, in Texas that knowing full well that 40% of homeless youth um, under 18 identifies LGBTQ. So you help homeless youth and you also um, are helping um, LGBT people. Knowing that they actively are partnering with homeless shelters for youth, knowing that that's going to bring them in close contact and, you know, um, space to love uh, LGBT people. And on and on and on it goes. So churches that hold to a traditional view of marriage and sexuality for the sake of maintaining theological credibility, or I would even say compellingness, need to um, also uh, take active concrete steps at loving and reaching out to LGBT people. That's it's not a magic formula, you know, so that they can, there is no so that. It's not so that they can, you know, right. stop being gay or whatever. And I, I'm using that phrase facetiously. Right. Um, it's not so that, but because it is an outflow of, the kindness that we have received from Christ. So we do it to those, especially people who have been marginalized by the religious elite. We do see Jesus. He see his, his part of his pattern of behavior. He does seem to target people who have had a specific history of being marginalized by the religious elite, adulteresses, female adulterers, <laughs> adulteresses, um, you know, w widows and lepers and w w whatever sinners, tax collectors. There, there were certain people that he, specifically seem to focus on these gospel writers present the narrative in that way. And so I do think there is a place for the church knowing the very dark and kind of gnarly history between the LGBT community and the church, which really flared up in the 1980s and how the moral majority um, attacked those suffering from AIDS. And there's just, there's a whole history here. And, and this is something I think Christians, if we call ourselves missionaries as we should, right? To be a Christian is to be a, to be missional, to be a missionary, not in the flying over saltwater sense, but I mean, just in, in, in the, in the basic sense of the term, we should understand the, the culture in which we're trying to reach. If you went to Nigeria, it might be good to understand something about mm, colonialization and, you know, the Muslim Christian conflict and uh, all that stuff. If you were a German the realities of tribal history too. I mean, they, all those people have their histories too. Oh but. yeah. I want to be a missionary to Rwanda. Well, do you know about the genocide in 94? Never heard of it. Well, it might be good to study up on that before you go in and start witnessing the Hutus and Tutsis and so on. Um, if you're a German missionary to Israel in 1950 and you're just completely oblivious to, you know, <laughs> uh, to, um, so, so for Christians, I think we need to understand, appreciate, learn from, and repent from um, the various strands of the narrative that our high, you know, our forefathers have built for us 
I mean, you can go, I don't know, go back to Stone, just start with Stonewall maybe and, and go from there. Listen to people, hear the stories. You know, uh, Caleb, Caleb Kaltenbach, a friend of mine who wrote a great book called Messy Grace, he was raised by a lesbian mother and a gay father. <laughs> his normal as a kid was marching in pride parades with his um, lesbian mother and her partner. And uh, he's now a, well, he was a former pastor, evangelical Christian. Um, and he tells stories about, you know, as a seven-year-old kid marching in pride parades. Well, as a kid, when you're surrounded by a bunch, bunch of people that love you, you love your mom, she loves you, your partner's your mom's partner loves you. I mean, this is the normal, this whole stigma that pride parades have for those on the outside, right. you know, a bunch of guys in feathers and leather thongs. And, and yes, that's there. But as a seven-year-old, you're surrounded by people that love you and care for you. And at the end of this pride parade, a bunch of people are squirting urine through water guns on the participants and people are screaming and, and people are yelling and screaming, you know, people with the signs, God hates fags, squirting urine on these people. And it's splashing across the face of the seven-year-old boy. And for him to go to look at his mom with, you know, tears in his face saying, why do these people hate us so much? And for her to look at him very gently and graciously and just matter of fact, say, oh, honey, Caleb, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Those are, those are Christians. And Christians just hate gay people. That's just, this is the world you're growing up in. Um, that's just... That's just the way it is. And he's like, oh, I never want to be one of those, you know. <laughs> and now he's a, you know, he ended up being a megachurch pastor. But, uh, you know, understand that like, those stories, whether people have experienced them or have friends who have experienced them or are part of a community that is swapping those kind of stories around, that is the narrative. And you could say, well, I've never squirted a and You out there probably haven't. But you, are, if you're an evangelical traditional Christian, you are identifying with a subgroup of a religion that has done that. Um, well, I'm, I'm a German missionary and I want to reach you. Well, I wasn't a Nazi. Well, no, but you bring that stigma with you. It's good to understand that so that when you're trying to deconstruct that view of yourself, you can be at least be aware of all the baggage that people are bringing to the table. All that to say, so I think the Christian church needs to understand that, needs to take concrete action to actually show that they believe Genesis 127, all people are created in God's uh, image. Until we do that, our theological credibility will not mean much in 2020 and beyond. Now, that's all sound, it might sound dark. Well, it's not supposed to sound dark, it's just supposed to sound just factual. My positive side is a, a growing number of churches are doing that. There is a very loud, very small progressive left in the church. There's a very loud, I would say, small um, radical right, you know, that is still very homophobic. You know, you still see people playing clips of that pastor in Arizona who, you know, has 18 people in his church and people spread these videos. You know, he's like, God hates fags and all this stuff. And it's like that, that the overwhelming majority of actual Christians don't, are abhorred by that rhetoric. Um, yeah. So I, my, I used to think that the trajectory is going to, within evangelicalism is going to keep going more and more and more affirming. I actually don't agree with that anymore. Um, every single Bible teaching evangelical church that goes affirming, it, as far as I know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, everyone that I've seen ends up radically shrinking in size. You know, I've seen churches go from like six campuses to one small campus when they move affirming. Um, uh, we know that denominations that are affirming, the main line, I think statistically in America, they're all shrinking, maybe not in the global South. Again, if I'm wrong, just, I mean, this is, I'm not, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, I see a growing number of so-called traditionalists, like all the people I've talked to on the higher ups at the CRC, I can name names. I probably, maybe I shouldn't, but I mean, I've talked to them and they all have gay friends. They, they all would echo everything I'm saying about loving and caring for gay people and repenting from, from how they've mistreated people. I mean, they, even that document, I thought that document they wrote last year was really good. I had, of course I have critiques here and there, but they were all pretty mind. Like they even began it. Their, their first step forward was not the Bible, it was very much, right? Wasn't it, yeah, Paul? Yeah, I mean, it yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. they went out of the way to say, if we have not love, then we yeah. are not being Christians. Yeah. And 
Uh, and I know, I know the people who wrote that document and, and the, I've sat down with them and talked to them. These are not homophobic bigots. So I, I think the church is going to uh, maintain a um, historically Christian view of marriage and sexuality. Generally speaking, I think that the um, affirming, here's my prediction. I think the affirming branch will probably establish kind of, I, I, I think there, I think lines will be drawn. I think denominations will split, uh, but I don't see the evangelical church. Um, I see it maybe shrinking in numbers, but, <laughs> um, but I don't see it kind of one, well, you know, people say, well, you know, in five years, the whole evangelical church is going to be affirming, right? I just, I just don't, no. See, what's the only denomination that's really growing in America? The SBC? Is it? I mean, I don't know. And I don't see the SBC going to affirming anytime soon, or for good or for you know, I, I'm not SBC, but um, I don't know. What, what do you? Yeah, do you have any thoughts on? Um... Well, I so on one hand, you know, and I saw this a number of years ago that I was wa in watching the Reformed Church of America and watching the RCA, thinking because what was happening is that in the RCA you have these. Um, East Coast, really mainline congregations. And so the Christian Reformed Church and the RCA, even though they have not really in America a history of animosity between them, there are usually relatives back and forth, but mm -hmm. at least with certain elements of the RCA, it became apparent a number of years ago, the RCA decided to have a big push in church planting. Mm -hmm. And that and the RCA has always been more experimental than the CRC. I mean, Robert Schuller was Reformed Church of America. Norman Vincent Peale was Reformed Church of America. And so the RCA has always had Robert of, Schuller. He was RCA. Yeah, he was RCA. Yeah, the Crystal Cathedral guy. The Crystal Cathedral was RCA. Wow. You know, he started, of course, with the drive-in church. So the RCA has always had a very different mix than the CRC, even though they're you know, cousins, mother, daughter, yeah. something like that. Um, but watching the dynamics you had, and something the RCA decided a number of years ago that they were really going to get aggressive in church planting. And mm -hmm. so the kinds of churches that were growing tended to be, well, this wouldn't surprise anybody who was watching the church world in the um in the united states over the last 40 50 years you had things like that looked basically like willow creek so you had big seeker mega mm -hmm. they were non-denominational kind of reformed church of america name only in many cases some of them weren't some of them were very much reformed church of america you had ethnic churches that were growing hispanic um they had some pretty vibrant hispanic ministry going um a friend of mine right down the street is pastoring Chinese Community Church, but it's Reformed Church of America. It's kind of non-denominational, RCA in name only, but this has often happened. This little Chinese group wanted some help from a denomination. They helped them out with money and minister, and so they've kind of yeah. been loyal to the RCA. Well, so then the RCA in the meantime is having this massive fight over same-sex you know, gay, lesbian issues, this kind of thing. You've got churches out east who are flying rainbow flags. You've got classes that are ordaining um, uh, gay and lesbian clergy who are in committed relationships, and the denomination wants to discipline them, but because of the particularities of Reformed Church, Reformed RCA polity, they couldn't. So this whole thing is happening. But I'm watching the church grow out west amongst in very evangelical ways and you have individual churches in the west that outnumber whole classes in the east and it's like well there's not too much question about where this thing is going and the east continues to try to buffer now there's a faction of rca churches that have basically decided they're 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 just going to they're going to they're going to get out of the whole thing but these churches tend to be large they they they're they look very non-denominational they want they want for one of the key things is they talk about we we don't want um we want to be able to dedicate children as well as baptize them see that wouldn't fly in the christian reformed church <laughs> but in the rca i mean so that's kind of the difference between them but it you know it's very clear that the RCA wasn't going to go completely affirming because the demographics are all wrong. 
Right. Because there's, and, and the more countercultural non affirming churches are, the more they will grow. And we know this from Lyle, you know, Shaler, and, and we know this from Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and cults that people who are out of step with the culture yeah. have sociological dynamics that make their group stronger. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's, it's what Kyle Harper showed that in, in yeah. from shame to sin. Yeah. That yeah. one of the means by which the persecuted backwoods, small Christian church dominated the Roman empire was by promoting a countercultural narrow sexual ethic. Right. <laughs> I mean, he even right. says like right. it was almost coterminous with salvation, not salvation with becoming a convert is leaving behind the cultural sexual ethic for something that ultimately was more humanizing that ended, right. ended up humanizing women. I mean, the Christian church often gets accused of being misogynistic and gosh, there's strands of that in many places. Uh, guess what? There, that was all over the culture as well. It's not like the Christian was promoting misogyny. And in fact, it was their sexual ethic that ended up putting an end, I think he said, or minimizing prostitution because they were hold, they were saying, even you men need to not have sex outside of marriage. Stop That's sleeping right. with prostitutes. And that was like the most unmanly thing to even say. You're going to tell me who, who I can't sleep with, you know? Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I and this is where I, I do challenge my um, kind of woke uh, traditionalists, people who are like, you know, very, very woke, very, you know, uh, they're BLM, they're all this stuff, you know, but they still hold their traditional sexual ethic. They're like, ah, I just can't get there, you know, but it's almost like they're embarrassed about, you know, it's almost like, but we don't really want to let anybody know, you know, and then, and, and there's a lot of LGBT people that are kind of calling BS on that saying, look, yeah. like we're tired of the bait and switch. Yeah. You, you, you let us be a part of your community for two years. And then when I, get engaged and bring my partner and say, can you marry us? And, and you say, Oh no, we think that's immoral. Like well, I've been here for two years and you, I never even knew that. So um, I, I think Christians should, the, the missionally minded socially concerned Christians should not shrink back from being upfront with yes. And we hold to a very countercultural sexual ethic. I think part of it too, Paul, is that the Christian, the traditional Christian church, has not really unpacked or articulated their sexual ethic very well. It's like we've adopted a secular view of marriage and sex. And our great contribution is a little footnote that says, but wait until you get married. Sex and procreation. Yeah. No relation. Um, why do you get married? Because of romance. You fall in love, you get married. Um, uh, you know, and we, 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 um, if you, if you're not married by 35, yeah, you're, you're, you're can't survive, you know, uh, sex. Oh, you need it to flourish. If you're not having great sex by the time you're 25 or 30 or 35, then, you know, mar marriage is completes you. I mean, all these themes that just come from the secular, a secular view of sexual ethic, but we had a footnote, but wait until you get married. And then when people do get married and they maintain their purity and now they're all traumatized with, I know you hear these stories about, yeah. Anyway, when, when sex is just tainted of no, 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 no. Okay. Now you're married. Now go for it. Well, that just doesn't, that doesn't work. What is, you've articulated this very well, Paul, you know, um, what is, what is marriage for? What, how many Christians who believe in a traditional view of marriage could even say what marriage is for? Yeah. Could they unpack a basic biblical theology of, of sex and marriage and singleness? Is marriage necessary for human flourishing? And do we live by that? Because obviously, um, this isn't an argument. It's just an observation. Obviously, the New Testament says, no, marriage is not necessary for human flourishing. Sex is not necessary for human flourishing. My goodness, we serve a single savior of marital age. Why, why wasn't Jesus married? That's well, right. it's not sinful. He could have been having loads of marital sex and been the sinless savior. <laughs> no, I'm just serious, triggered a whole bunch of people. Jesus having sex. Ah! Yeah. Well, is sex <laughs> marital sex bad? All this like, ah, oh, our circuits are blown, blown. But um, no, I think he was single. On, I think he was deliberately challenging a narrative in Judaism, not so much in Roman culture, but I mean, in Judaism, especially that, you know, if you're a man and don't have, you know, loads of kids and a wife that's just submitting to you, then you're not truly a man. I think he was challenging gender norms and theological assumptions so some of which were built in the old testament i'm not saying it you know um if all we had was the old testament we might say yeah you can't really survive as a human unless you get married you know um 
it's opened up probably so many other questions, but so, so I, I, all that to say, and I'll, um, I, I think rather than just saying, don't have gay sex, stand up for traditional view of marriage. I think we need to reach way back and unpack and disciple our people into a robust, I would say beautiful biblical theology of what it means to be a sexual human, what it means to be a sexed, biologically sexed human. Um, how do we think theologically about intersex people who are both male and female? Some of, some of whom, um, how do we think about um, sexual orientation? I mean, there's so many categories here that need to not just be addressed on their own. They need to be brought in, um, in conversation with a robust biblical theology of, of sex and marriage. So anyway, yeah. I, no, no, that's good. Well, and I, you know, so well, on one hand, what's interesting, and again, I've, I've been, you know, the whole Jordan Peterson journey, Rod Dreher's story is interesting. Rod Dreher, of course, is this blogger on the American conservative. And he, he was, you know, he was, he was sort of, you know, put off by the, the Gulf war, the, the George W. Bush administration. And he, but he all, he and his wife went to their Roman Catholic priest and said, you know, we want to practice, we want to submit to the teaching of the church on contraception, and we want to practice, we, we want to conform our life to the teaching of the church. And his local priest rolled his eyes and said, oh, you're one of them. And, <laughs> and, and what, that, what that immediately told him was that, what does it say about the church if my local priest doesn't believe in what the structure of the church is saying. And so then he went over to orthodoxy and, Mm -hmm. and what, and part of the reason that, I mean, if there's a, if there's a deeply conservative church, it's the orthodox. I mean, people, people, because people grow up in the Bible Belt and they've known Baptists and they think that's conservative. And then they bump into Jonathan Peugeot and they don't understand him. I say, you thought you thought the Southern Baptists were conservative? Go talk to Jonathan Peugeot. That dude is conservative. Well, what do you mean? Well, it's it's a symbol symbolism and the icons yeah. and yeah, that these people are really working hard to not change and they're serious about it. And and you, but you also find this in so another guy in in my little weird online world community is a young man named Julian who's Hutterite. So you know what that is. You know, here's, a, here's a Mennonite community that is, you know, yeah. actually practicing. And there's a deep attraction to people from that because they might look at the world and say, I don't know what to think. But at least these people live out their beliefs. Yeah, you know, Mormons yeah. have some of the same attractions. So, so, so that, has, that clearly has power just sociologically, psychologically. But, but the thing that this issue really, I think, forces us and takes us into very scary territory is that I think evangelicals for a long time, and not just evangelicals, but conservative Christians in America, for a long time have sort of been able to maintain the idea that we can sort of have our, have our thing right here and reach out and do ministries. We can babysit for the gays. We can be kind to them. We can be nice to them. But just as you said, well, and then, you know, be long before you believe, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But you're going to come to a point where here you have this table. And around it, we gather. And when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, so I was working with these tiny little groups of Haitians who were, for the most part, illegal, um, living and working in the Dominican Republic. And when it would come to communion, um, you know, when I would show up for a service, of course, here's a white guy who drives a Jeep into Nowheresville. And of course, everybody from the tiny little community is going to come and gawk at me for, you know, walk in and out of the two, three hour service, you know, because they all know everybody else here. But then when it comes to communion, then, you know, then you find out who's a church member in good standing, because basically, if you cross the pastor, he'll put you under three months of church discipline. And, you know, so then we get these baby bumpers that were 
that, that become the kneeling pads because they came from North America, you know, these, so you're, you're, you're on the floor, sometimes it's dirt, sometimes it's cement, of this tiny little place out in the middle of nowhere. You're kneeling on these baby bumpers that have Disney characters. The, um, the, the senior citizen saints of the church are wearing T-shirts donated with maybe, you know, like a Playboy bunny because what's this nice shirt with a rabbit? And I look at it and it's like, oh. And all the women are wearing ball caps because you know you have to have your head covered. And women, men are wearing pants and women are wearing dresses because you ought not to dress like the other sex and women aren't wearing lipstick or anything. And we're all on our knees around, there's you know 40 people for the service, but only 10 of us can take communion. And we've got some grape soda and some crappy bread and we're all first down on our knees, huddled on this, these baby bumpers in the front of the church. And first we, you know, first we have the foot washing. And so because I'm, I've got the highest status because I'm the missionary, which of course, the way I grew up, put things, other things like, oh, why, why, why is the white guy the guy with all the status here? That's just so wrong. But they wouldn't hear any other way. So, okay. And so then I wash everybody's feet and you begin to see what a 40 or 50 year old person who's walked barefoot for their whole life, their bottom of their feet is like hard like leather and it's cracked and it's pancaked. And so I'm washing their feet and then we're taking communion, you know, they're on the floor on these baby bumpers with, with soda and some crappy bread bought at the little corner store somewhere. But it's right here at this moment that the issue comes because, okay, you've, you've taken care of my baby. Um, I've listened to you preach. I'm, I'm curious about Jesus. I'm even attracted to him. I've even, I've even sort of wanted to come to a place where I'll, I'll promise to, to serve him. And I'm still wrestling with the resurrection, but I... And, and I've, I've started giving money to this thing that you guys have going here, and I'm attracted to it. And now suddenly when we're around this, but I'm, but I'm still married. And, and like, you know, I know what you say about marriage. You have a high view of marriage. And, and, and so what happens in the church is that we come to these moments and there are questions we can't resolve because on one hand we would say, hey, I, I, I don't know any way to square your lifestyle with what we're trying to manifest and embody as a community here. On the other hand, I don't see any justification for excluding you on this count and not me and how many others on that count from the radicality of this table. And so yeah. I, I sometimes wonder if, if God isn't sort of, I mean, he puts us in these places to, to just force us in a sense to level up. But then mm -hmm. you look at say the affirming, okay, so we're not going to police sexuality. I don't buy that for a minute. And I'm yeah. not going to agree with that for a minute. Yeah. And, and so he puts us in these places where we are just radically out of our depths and yet mm -hmm. have to act. And that's why this issue and, you know, and I was just talking to someone yesterday about this issue, because of course, like you say, you make videos about this and then people start yeah. coming to you and it's like, oh, why have I done this? <laughs> I have small church is nice, but, but, you know, people start coming to you and it's like, well, there's, there's, there's questions I can't answer. And there's levels of, of godliness and holiness and witness I can't embody, but I can't stop trying to at least keep embodying it either. And so so then again, we get to the problem of wineskins. And this issue has been, I've lately been reading a biography of Augustine and rereading a biography that I really enjoy about Augustine. And, you know, they had the Donatists mm -hmm. at that point. And 
you know, it used to be that the church in Hippo, everybody thought it was Augustine's because it was the big church. And recently they realized, no, that was the Donatist church. Augustine's, <laughs> Augustine's church was a little one over someplace else. I mean, this is Augustine. Wow. And, and so I sometimes wonder if it isn't part of God's glorious, ironic sense of humor that for many of us who think we have it all nailed down, God throws this thing in our midst and says, here, mm-hmm. here, you'll, you'll, you'll not get this right, yeah. but I won't let you off the hook to stop yearning and seeking and trying. And so here's an issue you can't nuance your way out of. Here's an antithesis you have to live with. And I I'm not ready to, you know, we, and this again goes back to Abraham Kuyper and, and St. Marie. Here you have an antithesis and we can't get rid of the antithesis. It'll always be there. And here you have common grace and we can't get rid of common grace and they'll always be there. And these two things, we can't embody them together and God never lets us off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word, man. I mean, I've often said, more to my conservative brothers and sisters, you know, who are maybe frustrated or, or, or uh, scared of, you know, uh, all the people going to Fermi or whatever. And why are we even having this discussion? Isn't this just 3% of the population and on it goes. And I'm, you know, I say, I, I, one of the, the blessings of the clashes and the disputes and debates and misunderstandings is that it's forced traditionalists to revisit their own skeletons in their closet you know to say wait are we are we consistent on what we believe about say divorce sex outside of marriage porn uh, you know because that's the that's the accusation that the conservatives get right and and rightly so you know I, by progressive thank you for to my progressive brothers and sisters to say what about all the straight sexual junk in the church and i lower my head and say thank you yes yes I'm not going to know if, ands, or buts, no, yeah, but, or what about ism, or what it's, yeah. The yep. standard is aspirational for all of us. <laughs> yep. Yep. yep, absolutely. Now, sometimes people spin it into a theological argument, and that's when it's like, well, that doesn't, you know, they say, well, since divorce is rampant in the church and porn's rampant, therefore we should embrace same sex relations. I'm like, well, it's, we can't, there's a difference between struggling with something we consider sin. Um, versus calling something sinful or righteous, right? I mean, no one's holding, you know, blessings on the porn industry on Friday night at the church. Come celebrate, you know, the latest porn movie we created, you know. Um, now, that doesn't excuse the struggle. Uh, okay, so not at all. Again, I'm not, I'm, I want to make a di- distinction between rank hypocrisy in the church that needs to be repented of versus maybe spinning the hypocrisy into, into a theological argument to justify um, something else. I, I'm Paul. I'm curious. I've listened to at least three of your videos, maybe not in their entirety. I think at least a couple in their entirety. And I think you mentioned, I think in the second one that you're, you know, you got a lot of pushback and all this stuff. I listened to them. I thought they were really good. Like I, what pushback have you been getting? I could probably guess, but I'm curious, like, what are some of the, are there any legitimate, like, Paul, you said this, and that's totally wrong because of this, or any? Well, I get stuff wrong. I get a lot of details wrong, and anybody who knows me knows that. Um, I, again, and it's nothing you wouldn't be familiar with. One side, you know, and because in my denomination, what I've been pushing for is what I call a confessional conversation, mm-hmm. and people hear that in different ways. But what I mean by it is. what we've been talking about and I think doing that we that this this question about this particular issue is embedded Mm -hmm. in many other things what is scripture you know what is what what is the nature of reality and and what happened in what happened in the in the protestant church you know in the time of the reformation is luther you know, Luther, I mean, we backed into this Reformation in a lot of ways because Luther posts 95 theses in Latin wanting to foment a, a conversation amongst the other church leaders who are also uh, about 
you know, some of the corruption he sees in the church, and everybody knew that there was rampant corruption in the church, indulgences, clerical offices, priest abuse, all this stuff. So post these 95 theses in Latin. Well, the printing press is now disrupting yeah. Europe in the ways like the internet has disrupted our world and our memory. And so some of his students translate it into, into German and put it into pamphlets and start passing it around. So now what could have been just a nice in-house confessional conversation between academics now takes on a political note. Mm. And so then the church sees a problem and Jan Hus wasn't that long ago, not too far away. You know, there've been Wycliffe, there've been all these other things and the church knows how to keep wraps on this. But of course, the elector, and he is an elector who is over the patron of Martin Luther, doesn't want to see this star get, you know, burned at the stake like Jan Hus. And so they push Luther. And Luther, you know, when I saw Jordan Peterson, I thought he's kind of a Martin Luther kind. It's, it's just kind of the personality that you push him. He's going to push back. So the yeah. harder you push him, he's going to keep pushing back. And you're just going to see the escalation <laughs> go. Yeah. And, and so Luther thought, well, it's just obvious. If we read the Bible really well, and Luther was a, 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 an amazing scholar with an amazing mind, if we read the Bible, the Bible plus reason will equal unity. Well, guess what? <laughs> Didn't happen. And so yeah. then suddenly the Protestant, and, and, and right, you know, with Karl, with Karl Stad, who was, you know, right there with Luther. I mean, they broke. And, and, and pretty angrily and radically. And so again, if you, if you up the resolution on stuff that ministers of the history, that ministers of the Christian Reformed Church should know, I mean, you shouldn't stop reading books when you leave seminary. Um, <laughs> and, and, so, and so what happens in the, in, the, in the early Protestant period is people start writing these confessions. And like in my tradition, the Belgic Confession. So of course, the Netherlands and what's the Netherlands and Belgium today? They're the Lowlands. They're they're owned by Spain and you know the emperors, and they start mm -hmm. revolting. And so um, Guido de Bray writes the Belgic Confession, and he writes this confession to the um, you know basically to the emperor, saying, "Look, this is what we believe. This is we we believe we are Christians with you. We believe we are." Catholic in many ways, but here we've got these points that we think the church has gone wrong. And let's, and of course, Guido de Bray would, you know, lose his life over this, as many would in that period. But, you know, by the grace of God, after an RCA session of General Synod, they don't go out and kill the losers of the vote. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. So, so Come let's. On. So let's do what you and I are doing here, what you have done in your book. What um, Bronson in the RCA, which I know you know because you had footnotes to it, you know, did in his book. Let's have the conversation, okay? And the church is going to have to, see, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to get around these issues in church. They're going to be synods. They're going to have votes. There's going to be policies. We're going to be feeling our way around this but mm -hmm. you know when you do an event with justin lee and you're both on stage and you're talking let's do that okay yeah. because yeah. coming out of it maybe we all know a little something else but we're gonna have to go deeper because the thing that probably uh, the thing that annoys people when I do my videos is because they want a political answer. And we do live in a political world and politics is something we have to deal with. But there's this other layer beneath that informs the politics and shapes the politics. And that's the layer we need to be working on. And but it's just not abstract talk that we put in books. It's. Mm -hmm what we do in churches and so how can we how can we as the church and i think it's happening mm -hmm. you know like you say how can churches continue to stay in these middle positions where god has thrown something at us that it's like i'm i neither can ignore it nor can i resolve it 
but I'm not going to take the easy way out of the tension. And no. a guy like Henry Nowen, who, you know, was this astounding Roman Catholic theologian who taught at Harvard and wrote books that are just dripping with um, wisdom and pathos. And, and then, of course, after his death, these biographies start to come out and say, well, he was gay. And he wrestled with this. Yeah. And, and so that, that thorn in his flesh produced, a, that thorn in his flesh coupled with a, a desire to not just be emotionally involved with our God, but be obedient mm -hmm. with crazy high standards created a saint that the world could stop, mm -hmm. Protestant Catholic, gay and straight, and look at and say, there's something there mm. that whispers of a world, you know, beyond this one that we can sort of see through it from the suffering. And there, in a sense, we have the cross of Christ, don't we? Yeah. And, and the church is always cruciform. And so, and I think, in a sense, when these issues come about, it's, it's in a sense, Jesus saying, I'm giving you your cross too. Mm -hmm. and it's going to kill you <laughs> as it killed me but stay on that cross yeah you can and, thank me later <laughs> and and so i want the church and and so you know the the in my own denomination we have a study committee reporting and good thing it wasn't 2020 in 2021 lord willing and by virtue of the way that, and there's denominational politics and that went into this. And, you know, this video isn't about that, but it will be imperfect mm -hmm. and it will cause disagreement and it will, you know, but I, I want us to keep trying and to keep loving mm -hmm. and to, and I think, you know, what I've appreciated about you is that unlike many people i think you've tried to stay in that space and i think that's what discipleship looks like mm -hmm. yeah that's a good word man i what, what do you what do you foresee are you allowed to say like in the next so in 2021 when the crc are they having like a debate dialogue are they deciding whether they're gonna maintain their the view they've had since their founding or whether they're going to open it up and be affirming and non-affirming no, or no. be, aff I mean, what's, what's the, what's the goal? What's the aftermath going to be? Well, the <laughs> aftermath I think is, oh, the CRC will not go affirming um, as a denomination. I don't think they'll make the move that they took with women in office where churches right. can go either way. I don't think they'll do that. Um, and I think for all the reasons that you said, at the same time, what I'd really like for the church to figure out how to do is how to have a better conversation because mm -hmm. it'll go to the synod floor. Um, there'll be speeches at the synod floor. Everyone will look at the clock and the calendar and they'll call a vote and the vote will be had and it'll be close. I mean, we watched it all roll out in the RCA how many times? Mm -hmm. And um, the the probably the um, study committee, their report will be adopted, probably recommended, but the, um, you know, the affirming political group then at some point will likely try a test case. And they'll say, okay, here in this church in classes, Grand Rapids East probably, we're going to um, ordain an openly gay. I mean, this, this, this has been mapped out in how many denominations. The roadmap is there, okay? And we're gonna ordain this person and we're gonna wait and see if Classus Grand Rapids East disciplines the church. And then, and then there'll be overtures from other classes telling Synod to order Classus Grand Rapids East to discipline the church. And, and then we'll have this fight. And then we'll have this fight as we had for women in office over 25, 30 years. And 
is 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 this how we do business what what that fight in over women in office cost the denomination was a lot and i don't know you no know, the rca looks like you know who knows what's going to they might splinter off into three groups and there's a group of churches in british columbia that are talking to the crc classes there but so there's you know there's moving people around and so on and so forth but I, okay, I, I don't have a better idea necessarily for how to adjudicate this, but I, I, I don't want to give in too early. Yeah. And, I, and so what I keep trying to say to my denomination is, whether it's about this issue, we had a, a so ra- the racial history of the denomination got focused on the question of the Belhar. And because of the way that the CRC didn't manage the conversation around the Belhar well, now it's successive synods. That comes up. You know, what's happening in the country right now about police brutality and the history of the the painful history between law enforcement and the African-American communities around the country, Los Angeles for one place, you know, if we if we don't find better ways of dealing with this history we keep okay so now we're you know now we've got we've got marches and that sometimes devolve into looting and protests and and so i you know i want to make a video about it today i'm looking for my um david garrow I can't find it. Um, book on, and it's like people, the the history of the civil rights movement mm-hmm. in the United States is so well documented. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so well known. If you read what was written only 40, 50 years ago, you can probably use that wisdom and do better now. Right, right. You're talking about Burying the Cross, David Garrow? Yeah. 87 yeah. Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. Great book. And and there's no reason <laughs> we have to do so poorly with this. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. And I don't yeah. know what to do. But what we're doing today is part of my contribution and my hope that we can do better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel very disoriented with all this stuff going on right now. That's gonna, that could take us another two hours to unpack. I know. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, completely unrelated because, again, I think no, the the web that holds all this together is well, power dynamics, politics, partisanship, um, <laughs> the the election coming up. <laughs> I just wonder how much of that is driving the coronavirus pandemic i mean we've managed to politicize that we've managed to put it we can we'll put you give us you know a blue sky and we'll politicize it i mean we're just it, it's that it's psychologically and sociologically fascinating like as i sit back in exile and look at how babylon is imploding um it, it's sad it really is sad um but it's it's also interesting i mean it's like wow this is this is this is crazy um I mean, Trump can sneeze and they would say it's a racist sneeze and, and, you know, conservatives will, you know, uh, defend his sneeze, <laughs> defend his sneeze. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a godly sneeze. It's the greatest sneeze that ever was. Yeah. He was the holding the Bible while he sneezed. sneezes. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, all it is, is grass for power. I don't, I don't think, I think if Trump doesn't get reelected, I don't, I think CNN will go out of business. I mean, I, what are, what are they going to talk Like, what's the. It's going to get boring just defending exactly Biden right. every day. I mean, that's like, I don't, what do you, there's going to be no negative news and people clickbait on negative news and there's, everything's going to be positive once he's out of office. I mean, I don't, it, so I don't know. It'd be, it's, it'll be well, interesting. And, and even in this issue, you look at, so I look at the rise of the progressive evangelicals as they're called. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I knew I, a little bit, the, uh, I, you know, I fair, I've around found Rachel Held Evans blog oh, fairly yeah. early on and 
even with my tiny blog, she sent me a book because she wanted, I mean, she was, she hadn't really risen that yeah. far yet. She sent me a book to, to, you know, to review her first book. And, but, but you get the sense that, yeah, what will, what would happen to many of the flying the affirming flag if there no longer was the, at least the image of the, of the hegemonic conservative to push against. And that's, that's, you know, and so in some ways what's happening to the mainline church is that they're, they no longer have an enemy. And right. so, and I think in the Christian reform church, for, for those who are, who have taken up the affirming position as a cause, well, what happens when you win? I mean, we've seen that in how many different, how many different areas now with the activization of a particular, because this is a methodology in order to achieve an end. Okay, once you achieve the goal, well, do you just, you know, does the March of Dimes go away when polio is, no, it's like, no, we've got jobs and structure and family and we've got all of this stuff. We need to find a new, and, and so, and we've seen that in, okay, same-sex marriage. There you go. It's done. Oh, but the the cause must go on. And okay, can you be a little bit more specific? And so now, well, we want an end to police brutality. Me too. Are you going to see it? How? Right. And and so we need we need to find better ways of 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 managing these conversations, people grab the tools off the shelf that had been used in the past to arrive at the world we have today. But some of the problems in the world we have today are functions of those tools we've used in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when we, when we avoid the wisdom that we have learned in the past and the ability to critique those tools, you know, maybe maybe you know finding some church somewhere where you can elect a um a gay married pastor in order to force the issue you basically look at your denomination and say you know are you going to discipline me are you going to mm-hmm. do it because if you do do it we're going to call you bigots and if you don't do it you don't really believe or care about anything you do and it's like that move right yeah. there there's something not very Christian about that move too, right, right, but you say, right. no, it's justice. Yeah. <laughs> ah, but how quickly hasn't justice? It used to be that God was a God of justice and Jesus and his mercy was the haven for sinners. And that's why we cling to him. You can find that in the songs. Mm-hmm, now mm-hmm. suddenly, well, it's me doing justice. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. That's different from God right. and his justice and the narrative of how Jesus and justice mm-hmm. come together. Now, now we're just sort of back to all the problems we've had with yeah. justice before Jesus. <laughs> well, what would you hope would happen with the CRC? I, I love how you paint that narrative, and I, I think you're probably correct. <laughs> I'm always nervous about predicting the future, but the the the, the you're you're basing that on how things have worked out in the past and the past in forms of the present and the future. And I think you might be onto something there, but if you were to say, okay, I'm in control of the future now, how would, what would you hope would happen in the CRC? Would you hope um, agree to disagree? Let's maintain unity. Would you say it should be like the women in office thing? Or do you think that if somebody starts ordaining, you know, affirming pastors or performing gay marriages, <clears throat> they should be disciplined and their license revoked. I know the ECC has had to go through this. I mean, the, the Evangelical Covenant Church is one of the most gracious, socially progressive, in a, I mean, say in, in every good way possible. I mean, they were ordaining women before that was even a thing. I mean, that was, you know, they were woke before woke was a thing. You know, they, um, racial reconciliation has been a huge passion of them back in the 60s and 70s you know and yet they hold their traditional view of marriage and they they've had to face this almost against their very d not against their dna against their posture maybe which is hyper gracious hyper understand they've had to say yeah. at the same time it's 
you signed the paper that said I will abide by whatever our standard. Yeah. One of our standards yeah. is you can't be a pastor and perform yeah. a gay wedding, whether yeah. you agree or disagree. I mean, I, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and if you do, your license is gone. So when they violate that, we're like, hey, we're, just, we're just following the statement that you signed, you agreed to when you said you want to be a pastor in the CR, in the ECC. Do you, do you, is that kind of the perspective you would have with the CRC? Or? Well, my first, my first recommendation is to not put Paul Vanderclay in charge. That's my first recommendation <laughs> because, you know, if, you know, you've seen, people have seen the dramatic success of my local church. So um, <laughs> if, if you want to replicate that, well, maybe, but so I, you know, I think we, I think number one, we need to find ways of once again personalizing and localizing without necessarily having to politicize. And so again, I look at my friend, my friend Rod Hugan, who he would so love to have. So he was a CRC church planter who was dramatically um, um, unsuccessful in a part of the CRC that was sort of imploding. And there was some home missions money that was left over and the home missionary kind of said to him, gosh, to give the money back would be so much paperwork. Just do something Christian for the next few months. And he, and he wound up finding a Baptist um, guy and together they planted a church and the, he can't really make it part of the CRC and it isn't, but it's sort of, they go to CRC classes meetings. And so it's a weird church and their membership isn't CRC. They sign, people sign on to, to be a member of the church for a year. And there's all kinds of theological reasons why that's a bad idea, but that's kind of what they've done. And they practice radical submission to each other. Yeah. And, and, and so I see in experiments like his glimpses of hope because yeah. You can't take what's happening in the village in Tucson and scale it up to the Christian Reformed Church. That'll never work. But the Christian Reformed Church has shown an ability to say, well, they're part of us. We're not sure how, but they're part of us. And, and so um, I, I think I, I don't have a specific list of recommendations, but what I'm asking for is more of a spirit that we, that we not that, that, that we not try to back each other into corners too quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And that we even, I mean, it's, it's part of what we've seen broken down on the, in the, at the partisan level in the nation in that, you know, are, you know, can Democrats and Republicans fight like cats and dogs on the Senate floor, but then go home and have coffee together? You know, the Dutch had, you know, it's a lot of, there's still a lot of drug laws in the Netherlands, even though people go there to do drugs. And partly because the Dutch created this culture of sort of selectively looking the other way about some things because it seemed wise, even though they maybe didn't instantiate it into laws. Now, you can't do that systemically without losing a system. But if there is a culture of sort of doing that, you can begin to experiment with things and gain some wisdom at the small scale that later on the larger structures can benefit from that wisdom. Mm. And, I, and I think yeah. that's what we do. That's what the evangelical church tries to do a lot of ways. But again, I don't think that denominations have their problem. Non-denominations have their problem. I mean, everything has problems. I'm a Calvinist. So <laughs> let's, let's figure out how to how to gather wisdom from the mess. And mm -hmm. I think there's some of that wisdom built into the structure of the United States where there's always this tension between the federal and the states. And I think mm -hmm. when they get that tension wrong, things get out of whack. And, you know, and, and there are no mm -hmm. answers in any of that to anything, but there is hopefully a path to wisdom because, okay, so your local pastor and this gay couple has started worshiping. And and, you know, is it any different with a polygamous couple? And again, what even once we start doing analogies, well, then yeah, there's yeah. all analogies are problematic. OK, right, but right. what I'm saying is that the church always has a problem with. You know, the mm -hmm. table is for believers. Oh, what do you mean by believer? 
The mm -hmm. table is for people who are, and this is what I always tell people, and the Christian Reformed Church hasn't got, the table is for people who are earnestly sorry for their sin. Mm -hmm. Well, that means, well, right there is where you live in that tension, right? I'm earnestly sorry for my sin, but I keep sinning anyway in these ways. And so, and so being earnestly sorry means I need to address it, but that might take a while and it might be very messy and, 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 and can we have churches that actually begin to live into that tension in a way that isn't a political cause in order to use, and I'll use Greg Boyd, an open theist, in order to use power over each other. And there's where some of my Mennonite yeah. sensitivities perhaps come <laughs> out because one of the things, you know, uh, Richard Foster's Streams of Living Water in that book mm -hmm. where he talks about, okay, so the Protestant world fractured. Well, you know, the Reformed get some things right. The Mennonites get some things right. The Orthodox get some things right. The Catholics get some things right. We're all, we're all not getting it all right. And Calvinist, we won't. But I can, I can learn from the Catholics, and I can mm -hmm. learn from the Orthodox, and I can learn from the Mennonites. And, and so together, maybe we can, Christianity is a progressive religion. And yeah. again, I yeah. don't want to get into a mill, post mill, pre mill, but we are on a journey towards up that hill towards yeah. the city of God. Yeah, yeah. So I I don't have any specific answers, but I want to see denominations in, you know, one of the things I learned with the women in office thing. In the Christian Reformed Church, the most important early missionary abroad was Joanna Veenstra, who. Well, she would not be a Christian Reformed minister. There were ample reasons why she should not have been a missionary, but she went to Africa in all of the colonial mess that she went, you know, mm -hmm. but she went to Africa and along the way, good things happened. Mm -hmm. And so I want a little bit of Christian liberty. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Christian patience that together maybe we can have some local experiments by which we learn something. I just wonder, you said something earlier about um, something along the lines of, you know, the, the manner in which we go about having this discussion is incredibly important. I, I, I just think that that needs to, you can't overemphasize that. Again, we live in a climate today when everything is so polarized and I don't typically use like football analogies, but it's almost like the linemen have just cleared this wide open path for the church to run right through and model a different way where we can have significant disagreements. We can maybe even think somebody else is outside the faith. <laughs> yeah. And even oh, if we they do are, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yet they're still created in God's image. Right. That's right. Um, that's right. And so kindness is never not an option. Never not an option. It's always a necessity. And so if with the world looking on, with the world used to seeing, especially the Protestant church, be so fragmented and backbiting and power plays, and we have a wide open opportunity to model humility within um, conviction. I'm not asking anybody to let go of their convictions unless I would ask them to reconsider it if the evidence upon which their conviction stands is not strong and the counter evidence is stronger. Of course, I would ask anybody to, I, I've done that many times over in my life and will continue to do that. But in, in, and I know the CRC and the broad scheme of things maybe isn't a very highly visible social uh, community in, in America <laughs> at the in, same in time. Grand Rapids, Michigan, perhaps. Yeah, but no yeah, place actually, else. Which is, so my ministry, as, as I think you know, is largely rooted in Grand Rapids. I'm, I go out there all the time and I, I, there's a lot of power in West Michigan held by Christians with loads of wealth. Um, I've, you know, I've sat down, I've sat down at a table where the, the small number of people at that table in a random coffee shop in Ada County somewhere probably accumulated over $2 billion cumulatively. Yeah. This is a lot of Christian yeah. 
well, there's a lot of power there. So yeah. I, and, and yeah. the CRC yeah. obviously yeah. and RCA is wrapped up into that. So yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the, the, um, the, the level of power that the CRC might, might have, but for the world that might be looking on for them to witness, to be really specific and concrete, a possible split at the very least, the potential of a very volatile spat disagreement yelling match to see kindness humility understanding charitable interpretations of what somebody else is saying in the midst of disagreement yeah i think that can go a long way and can can give the church a small glimpse of credibility that the kingdom of god we are speaking of is a better way to live than all the alternative kingdoms that are propped up by paper thin partisan rhetoric yeah I, I don't know that the Christian Reformed Church has enough strength in it left to split. Really? Yeah. I, and it's similar to the RCA. You know, it could be that if the RCA splinters, some elements of it will join the CRC. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you see, the irony of the progressive, the irony of the, what, what today is seen as the progressive agenda is when, when the when when groups when progressive voices in the denomination just like you saw in the umc when progressive voices in the denomination call for greater elements of voices of people of color well those koreans and those african americans and those hispanics generally speaking are theologically pretty conservative <laughs> and so you're not going to get both your your racial diversity and mm-hmm. your you know your new uh, your new deconstructed genderism. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, yeah. You're not going to get them both. And so right there, okay, so here you've got your progressive vision. I, mm-hmm. I, that, that, I, you're, not, you're not getting out of it either. <laughs> and, and so, again, yeah. it just gives God just puts these things in our path and says to us, oh, man, do you think you know the way? Right, here, right. let me give you this. And, you know, yeah. tell, tell me, tell me, Job. Were you yeah. there when I laid out the stars? You even, know? With the, even with the LGBT conversation, um, you know, after 2015 with the emphasis now focusing on the TQ plus, yeah. um, that if you look, if you pay attention to the secular discussion going on, you see that there's all kinds of um, let's say, uh, just internal uh, contradictions that are being exposed. Some of the loudest opponents of certain forms of trans activism are lesbian feminists. <laughs> so my, and this is where the, um, in this, okay, I'm going to, it's already, we're already almost two hours in. So maybe not as many people are listening. Cause I'm about to say something kind of offensive to some people, but this is where I think some of the not progressives, but specifically Christian progressives um, can sometimes, I just, I want them to pay more attention to like secular progressivism because it's like, sometimes the worst progressives are the Christians, you know? Um, and by worst, I mean like just that they, they, they're blind to some of the inconsistencies, you know? I, so I asked my friends, you know, are you a feminist or are you, you know, a, a, a trans activist ally? Yeah. Well, I'm everything. Well, it, p- part of the DNA, the driving force of 20th century feminism is that the female body is part of the definition of what it means to be a woman that going through your menstrual cycle uh, being uh, dog whistled as a 13 year old girl all this stuff is built into the very thing that drives fem- feminism and so when you know a 55 year old olympic athlete with autogenophilia you know tendencies comes out and says i'm a woman like that the, the have you read the feminist response to that? <laughs> you know like um which is fine but as somebody who's a huge fan of loving neighbor and enemy alike i mean i think the christian even then let's not pick side like oh, okay which which side do I, no no you're on jesus's side and jesus would have loved them all and he would he would have been disruptive to them all as well while loving them you know yeah. <laughs> um well, so I, I don't know i mean i i just um well, I wish that, I could... that's where that's where so in the christian reform debate so i've you know so you know i'm i'm in the politic political layer too and so i will challenge the progressives and say okay so you want to affirm same sex marriage how are you going to freeze because yeah the nice lesbian mm-hmm. couple down the road who both have middle class jobs and their children are wonderful and well adjusted and well behaved and all of that well there's you know I'm I'm looking at the next generation of who are deconstructing the gender binary. Yeah. 
yeah, and yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. so then, they, well, we're not going to police anything. Really? Really? You're going to shut up yeah. about pedophile priests? You're going to, yeah. I mean, because the, the <laughs> one of the things, so going back to all the Jordan Peterson stuff and all this stuff, I mean, why, why am I both interested in all of the Jordan Peterson stuff and these other issues? And how did my interest in these other issues land yeah. me in the Jordan Peterson stuff? Well, they're because all related. They're all related. They're all related. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How how exactly does your your hierarchy of values cohere? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's and, a great and, word. And I see this. I mean, a, a number of years ago, I, I had to coin a phrase because I didn't have a name for it. I I I started reading everyday feminism. Um, um, I, everyday feminism online. I said, well, okay, every day. And so I started reading everyday feminism every day because I wanted to know. Okay. Yeah map out for me your new world order. And one of the things I learned was you thought the Mosaic law was rough. <laughs> Look at that law. Yeah. And this thing does not look like it's going to cohere or become stable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no, the, the point that you just made, okay, I'm willing to listen to the progressives. I'm asking for conversation which with both sides are open. I'm willing to listen to your proposal. You need to have something other than we're always liberating from whatever right. Christendom strictures have been in colonial structures have been imposed on us. That doesn't work. And, right. and we can see that. Right. So... Right. If you're going to bring a proposal, you need something other than no, not that. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, that's good. It's, yeah. Man, where are we going to be in two years, Paul? I'm going to be over here at your church. I'm going to be moving to Sacramento and uh, <laughs> being the youngest person in here. <laughs> well, I, 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 again, I want to say, I want to say, Preston, that I, I deeply appreciate you and what you're doing because in many ways, I'm going to use this terrible word ally. You know, I, I see you <laughs> as an ally of someone who is trying to stay in this space and say, we're going to keep listening and we're going to keep mm -hmm. trying and we're not going to grow weary in the journey. And even though it's hard and even again, Jesus was killed mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and Jesus he doesn't promise anything less. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that's that. Well, I don't know how much more time we have. I wanted to ask you about the Benedict option and your thoughts on that. Cause you mentioned Rod Dreher and it seems like you were kind of toying with that idea. I haven't even read his stuff on that, but I, it, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think he's onto something in that just like you and I said, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be, small groups of committed Christian communities that try things yeah. and are committed to each other and they're committed to um, they're committed to orthodoxy and they're committed to orthopraxis. Mm -hmm. And so when when I look at Jonathan Peugeot and the Orthodox and when I look at Julian and the Hutterites and when I look at you know you know my my father, um, I think about my father growing up in the, you know, post-depression Midwest, um, goes to Patterson, New Jersey in 1960. My father knew, I don't know if my father knew anything about African-American culture or community at all. When I think about where and when he grew up, yeah. he probably saw black porters on trains. <laughs> And then he comes to Patterson and he's got to, over the next 36 years of his life, learn about it. And so every year in Black History Month, the church would have this, um, this Black History contest. And my father would win. And it's like, well, that's hardly fair. Um, you're the pastor. And, but my father read a lot about Black history and steeped himself in it. But, but what, what enabled my father, within the years of serving a people that he hardly knew, to be immensely embraced by that community is because he came there with a humble, 
Christian spirit and said, I'm going to try to love you. Mm -hmm. And he got lots wrong. And, you know, Northside Chapel never graced the cover of Christianity Today. And I could go on forever all of the ways that that church and that experiment fell short. But what that experiment did do was create and Stan and others, and I'm a part of that legacy. Um, I think what is at the heart of this, which is this humble servant of all, learning to love, trying then to instantiate that in a living, breathing community of Christ mm-hmm. followers mm-hmm. huddled mm-hmm. around the table. Yeah. That's, That's good, man. Isn't, isn't that? isn't that the church jesus spends three years with his disciple crucifixion resurrection acts one they come to him with the question now will you restore the kingdom to israel yeah it's like (laughs) i i i come to earth i deal with you with you mopes for how many years i do astounding miracles in front of you I tell you what's going to happen. Does do any of you show up Easter Sunday morning waiting for me to walk out of the tomb? <laughs> I I come back from the dead. You put your fingers in my hands yeah. and you hit me with this question. <laughs> but you will receive power. Yeah. But but what kind of power does Jesus give? What's the kind of power to stay up on that cross? Because isn't that the power that we look at and say, he loves me. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I don't necessarily know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But he loves me. And so even if he is soft on sex trafficking of Jewish girls, even if he's soft on Roman oppression and the the, the perversion of Tiberius Caesar— I'm going to stay with him. Isn't that the Christian life? That's good. I I don't know a better answer. (laughs) Embodying the cruciform posture of Jesus. I mean, I, we're striving to love people well, admitting that we're going to do it imperfectly. I mean, there's, we almost come back to some of the classic Christian cliches that if we actually lived them out, wouldn't, wouldn't be so dull, you know, it would actually be, uh, powerful. And I, yeah, I think journeying with humility. I mean, some of the, again, these basic Christian virtues that, um, when we get wrapped up into the outrage of today, and again, there's a lot of legitimacy to the outrage, but humility is, is never an option. We never, there's never a place to say, well, I'm going to be outrageous today and not be humble. That's not, it's never not an option. I'm going to be outrageous. I'm going to fight against injustice and I'm not going to be loving towards my enemies. That's not an option. That's not. And when we fall into those polarized binary categories, if if we're going to pursue this branch of morality, then we're not going to focus on this. That's just, that's not the Christian way. The Christian way is a messy, complex web of cruciform living. Um, And I think it's getting harder and harder though. The more we are tethered to our, political allegiances i keep bringing that up i keep shouting out to my mennonite brothers and sisters but yeah yeah well and that's you know and that's where you know the reformed and the mennonites you know kind of are we politically involved or not well you're almost mm-hmm. always politically involved even if you're a hutterite you know welding dumpsters yeah. and um mm-hmm. just by virtue of that benedict option you yeah. know yeah I, I looked at i look at Dreer's benedict option and i think well, Christian Reformed Church has, and many other churches, have practiced that. We had our own Christian schools, our own little community. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that wealth that you can find in Western Michigan or Northwest Iowa, it's all a function of that, you know, the, the, the Dutch mafia. You know, we're, it's, it's us and our own. But then, of course, that bumps into racism. And, yeah. and so yeah. we, keep, we keep working the program. But it does seem to me, it does seem that if you lose, if you lose the thread of, and this is why I, um, you know, people, if you lose the thread of, of, of the scriptures, of the biblical teaching, 
of you know of the radicality that it calls you to you know then then somehow you wind up just out there mm -hmm. as a non-player mm -hmm. character manifesting the spirit of the age mm -hmm. and and i think actually and i think it's i think i i try to make a, a rational case for it the chesterton did too we include in our you know basically our council our ancestors and we do that by the scriptures mm -hmm. and and we do that by submitting to the scriptures mm -hmm. and we do that by trying to embody trying and and an and individual is too small a space it needs to be a community and the community has to scale but it's it's and again the more jordan peterson work i do and philosophical work i do and my conversations with non-theists like john verveke and and really conservative people like jonathan peugeot i i that feeds my appreciation for the challenge of this but also the reality of this that that the path that you have taken the reason you're in exile well on one hand no one should be in exile on the other hand there are real good reasons why you're in exile and those speak well of the process that you have devoted yourself to yeah paul i appreciate your ministry man i gotta run uh yeah. but keep up the great work i just uh i hope you keep growing. I know you can care less about growing for growing sake, but I think you are uh, scratching an itch that a lot of people have. And I'm so, so thankful for that. I, I, I'm just constantly impressed with how widely read you are. I just, uh, you bringing together so many different themes from so many different other disciplines as someone who has to dabble in various disciplines. I know how much work that is. And uh, I just, I love it, man. Yeah. Curious, small church, ADHD. <laughs> Simple formula. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thanks right, for having Preston. me on. I really appreciate it. And, thanks for uh, being here. Thanks to the audience for enduring uh, this. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be, uh, be in the community on All some right. level. We'll talk again. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.